look on over onto the left hand side as we head into the little literary forest you're going to notice some animals over there with a lighter tan color to their coat those are called greater kudus and they are females you can tell because they do not have horns males have more tall spiral horns on the top of their heads and out here towards the left hand side as well these animals with the reddish brown colors to their coat are called bongos and bongos are also known as the ghosts of the forest as they are very elusive and oftentimes pretty hard to spot so you can leave the safari here saying you saw a ghost out in animal kingdom over here on our right hand side there were two animals uh, well three with the two saddlebelt storks but there was an okapi back there in some of that brush the okapi is actually closely related to the giraffe even though they do have hind legs that resemble that of a zebra the okapi is the only living relative to the giraffe and they have a prehensile tongue which allows them to reach brush in more difficult places their tongues are so long that they can use them to clean out their eyes and ears <laughs> now here sitting on the left hand side that is a black rhino resting about black rhinos are currently critically endangered there's only about 5,000 left on the entire planet they're being poached hunted and killed for their horns and their horns made out of material called keratin which is the same material that makes up your hair and nails so essentially are losing these beautiful black rhinos for a product that is worthless so we really do need to help protect them that 5,000 does include out in reserves like these and in the wild and black rhinos are much much smaller than their white rhino counterparts black rhinos only weigh about 3,000 pounds each and something pretty cool about those saddlebelt storks that we saw back there is that they mate for life. So that was a mated pair out here. They're gonna spend their entire life together. If we look on over towards the right hand side, it'll go nice and slow as we had on past, but there is a hippo in the water over there on the right. Hippos can spend six to eight minutes underwater at a time, and they do so to protect themselves from predators and also to protect themselves from some of that harsh sunlight. Although hippos may look pretty adorable, they're actually one of the most dangerous animals on the entire planet. They're very, very territorial. They like to protect their spaces. But they are herbivores, they do eat only plants. During the nighttime, they can travel miles away from their usual water holes. They'll head on over towards the grasslands or the savannah, where they can feed on up to 80 pounds of vegetation in one night. And around this island, these are pink back pelicans. Pink back pelicans get their name from the pink patch that appears in their back during mating season. They also have a wingspan of approximately nine feet, so if they were to stand on top of our canopy here today, the rings could go from one end to the other with wise. Now I'm gonna take it nice and slow, Holy poly, very slowly as we head around these vents. Not only to watch out for some more pelicans and hippos, but because I have heard some warnings about these predators coming up around this vent. These are Nile crocodiles over here on the left-hand side of the bridge. And these are crocodiles, not alligators, oh. you can tell by their mouths. Crocodiles have a more toothy grin. They show more teeth than the mouths are close. They only eat about once a week, however, they can go up to three months without eating anything at all. And a crocodile can grow to the same length that a giraffe grows tall, so about 20 feet in length. Notice the ecosystem around is changing just a little bit. That is because we are headed towards the grasslands, again, also known as the savanna. The savanna is shaped by the animals that live on it, and sometimes you'll hear elephants referred to as the bulldozers of the savanna. That is because their migrations will knock down many of the trees that may be in their path. So if you see any knocked down trees in here, it might be a good sign that elephants have been around. Looking on out towards the right hand side, this is a large baobab tree. And baobab trees are also known as the tree of life or the upside down tree. They get their name based off the fact that they go the majority of the year completely leafless, about nine months of the year without any leaves. Can sometimes make their branches look like roots. That's where they get one of those nicknames, the upside down tree. And we are now headed towards one of my favorite views here. This is the overlook of the savannah. It makes for some beautiful pictures. Now the savannah is pretty flat, so you're going to be able to see some animals way out there in the distance. Don't worry, I see them too. But I'm only going to talk about the ones that are closest to us as we head out on our way. Immediately at the bottom of the hill, over here on the right, you're going to notice a tower of Maasai giraffes. These are the Maasai giraffe and not their cousin, the reticulated giraffe. You can tell by the pattern on their coat. The Maasai giraffe is a more irregular pattern, whereas the reticulated giraffe is a more symmetrical one. It's a little bit less blotchy. And giraffes are some of the tallest animals on the planet, reaching heights of almost 20 feet tall. When they are first born, they can be about 6 feet tall. Some said they get their first breath of light from their initial shock at their drop at birth. They have that same prehensile tongue that we saw in the Okapi earlier. Wherever their tongues are more purple issue, and they can be as long as your forearm to the tip of your fingers. That purple issue on their tongue is to help protect them from the sunlight, as their tongues are out so often throughout the day that they do risk getting burnt. Now, as we head a little bit further ahead, I do notice a den approaching over here. Oftentimes, dens like these are home to some of Africa's predators. Do you actually see some spotted hyenas out here to the left? And these are hyenas. Hyenas are very, very ferocious. When they are born, they are born with a full set of teeth and their eyes wide open. They are a matriarchal society, so that means that the lowest ranking female is still ranked higher than the highest ranking male. So they have some girl power over there for the hyenas. 
Oftentimes they are mistaken for African wild dogs or other members of the canine family. However, they're actually more closely related to the feline family, meaning cats. They're a whole separate family of their own though. It's kind of like how foxes are more closely related to cats than dogs. Now here to the left, lying about behind some of that deadfall are gonna be some caramel colored antelopes. Those are the sable antelopes. They get their name from that dark sable color to their coat. And they are the emblem here on the Harambe Wildlife Reserve. They were chosen to represent us as our name Harambe means to come together or to bring together. So in times of distress, these beautiful sable antelopes will come together as one to protect themselves instead of running about in all different directions. If you look at the top of the giraffe's head over there, you're gonna notice some small horns. Those are called ossicles, and they are bones that are connected to their skull. Then it'll first start off connected. They lie flat on the back of their head so they can be birthed just a little bit easier. And when it comes to the okapis and the giraffes, both the males and females for the giraffe will have these ossicles, where with the okapi, only the males will have these ossicles, those small little horns up there. Over here on the right-hand side, you're going to notice some animals walking around over there that kind of look like s'mores on legs. Those are called springboks, and springboks are some of the smallest antelopes on the planet, only weighing about 100 pounds. They get their name based off the fact that they can jump about 6 feet high in the air and 13 feet forward. When they do this all together as a group, it's called promkey. And also at the top of that hill over there, you're going to notice a very, very small herd of white-bearded wildebeest. That is in fact a small herd, as their migrations can have numbers of up to 1.5 million. They get their name from the Afrikaans word for wild beast. They also have the nickname the Nu from the low bleeding noise that they make. And something pretty interesting about the wildebeest is that they can learn to walk and run within about 15 minutes of being born. If they don't learn this fast, they may be abandoned by their families. It's very, very sad, but it doesn't happen too often. Their migrations are super important to them. We do also see some young baby giraffes out here towards the right hand side. It's important that we are seeing some young giraffes as their numbers are at risk out there in the wild. There's actually less giraffes on the planet than there are African elephants. And all the way up towards the top of this hill and behind that baby giraffe over there, you're going to see some Uncoli cattle. The Uncoli cattle are also known as the Watusi cattle, named after the tribe that first domesticated them, the Watusi tribe. They are some of the only domesticated animals out here on the reserve. And looking at those horns, you might be thinking, wow, those must be heavy. However, those horns are mostly hollow on the inside with a honeycomb structure. They have blood vessels located on the inside of those horns, which allow them to cool off on those hot days or here by waving them around. And they are regarded as a sign of wealth by many African tribes, not used for any form of consumption. So during the nighttime, they're herded into thorn pens called bone to help keep safe from predators. If you look out underneath all these trees, you're going to notice a very, very straight line under there. That is actually the maximum height that these giraffes can reach with their next to eat some of this vegetation. As I mentioned, the animals out here do shape their ceramics. And notice that the grass at a pretty even level as well. The grazing animals help to maintain this balance too. And it does look as though we are slowed down just a little bit out here. These are wild animals, so they do decide where and when they would like to cross the road. Sometimes it gets us a little bit backed up. We call this a giraffic jam. It's one of the few jokes that we make out here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I always love the three laps and grow from everyone else. Anymore. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be here all week. Correction, two weeks. And as we head a little bit farther forward, you're going to notice a tree that has been knocked down coming up over here on your right hand side. Does so anyone remember what this might be a good sign for? Elephants. This is a good sign for elephants. Looks like we have some A plus students for. So from here on out, we are going to keep our eyes peeled for elephants. Can't make any promises though, as their migrations do move quite frequently and they are very reclusive. But it does look as though our suspicions were correct, because out here towards the right hand side, these are two African elephants. Oh my gosh. You can tell that these are African elephants not only by the shape of their ears, their ears are shaped like the continent of Africa. You can also tell that these are African elephants by the fact that we are in Africa. <laughs> now, elephants are being poached very sadly, much like rhinos. They're being poached for their tusks. And their tusks are made out of a material called ivory, which makes them products such as piano keys and small figurines. Their numbers are dropping fast out there in the wild, though, so we really do need to help protect them. We're losing about 96 elephants every single day out there in the wild. But reserves like these are helping to keep them safe. This might have been a couple males over there, as they were in a little bit of isolation. Males will oftentimes break off from the herd at the age of maturity, about 13 years of age. But they'll do so because they can get just a little bit rowdy, so they like to stay separate from the females and form their own bachelor herd. <laughs> as we head underneath this bridge, you're going to notice some red clay that's all around us. If you look on over towards the right-hand side, you'll notice some tusk marks in of this red clay. Elephants will oftentimes eat this clay for the minerals on the inside, because the essential vitamins that they need for their diet. You'll also see some footprints on the ground over here on the left, so it might be a good sign that there is another herd coming up. Elephants are very, very social animals. During the daytime, they'll hang out with their more extended families and friends. But when it comes to nightfall, they'll go with their more direct families, such as mothers and their young. 
Mother elephants can bond with their young almost instantly at birth, and that is because mother elephants are pregnant for almost two full years, about 22 months. Oh and an interesting fact gosh. that was discovered about elephants out here on the reserve is that as large as they may be, they are afraid of honeybees. They really do not like them. This helped to save their numbers out there in the wild, as many farmers have resorted to hunting down elephants. They do so because their migrations can trample right through their crops, leaving them without a lot of the crops that they need to help support their communities and their families. So to prevent this, farmers have now started to put up bee fences. And these bee fences not only keep the old crop safe, but provides them with the new crop of honey while doing the number one thing, that is protecting these beautiful elephants that can be around for years to come. We're going to see another one of these on Coley cattle over here towards the left-hand side. They are beautiful. Coming up ahead of us, there is a pretty large watering hole over here. Oftentimes, animals like elephants will hang about by these watering holes. It is one of their main forms of hydration, and it can also help to cool them off by throwing water onto their backs with their trunks. I do believe that there are a few more elephants coming up on the other side over here, so we're going to try to pull a little bit farther ahead. Also on the other side of this watering hole, it does look as though there is Flamingo Island approaching. And Flamingo Island is home to, as you may have guessed, flamingos. These are going to be the greater flamingo. They're the tallest and the palest of the flamingo species. You might have also noticed the ducks over here on the left. These ducks are on vacation all the way from Florida. I actually <laughs> flew over here with Donald Duck. I picked them up from the airport myself. I got a few weird looks in my safari truck, but I'm sure they appreciated the ride. Now, these beautiful flamingos don't actually first start off as that bright pink color. They get it after about one to two years of life comes from their diet of small crustaceans such as brine shrimp, which has a material in it called beta carotene. That's what gives them that beautiful pink color. You're going to notice another elephant over on the other side of those rocks over there. Be just a little bit harder to see. And a group of flamingos isn't going to be called a flock like most birds. They like to strut about their stuff and show off their beautiful pink. So a group of flamingos is known as a flamboyant. And as we head on through these walls over here in just a moment, you are going to notice a warning that our warden has put up to any poachers that might be in the area. Looks like they've confiscated some of those tusks and horns that the poachers have stolen, from animals that they've hunted. Again, many of the animals we are seeing out here are endangered and are at risk of extinction. Some of the leading causes behind this are poaching and hunting, as well as habitat loss. And all of these are caused by humans. We do have the ability to bring it to an end as they can be around for years to come. Now walking around by this mud pit out here to the left, there are some ostriches. Oh and the ostrich is one of the fastest land animals on the entire planet. They're the fastest ones to run on two legs, running at speeds of about 40 miles an hour. That does look as though it is a female over there, as she does have a little bit of a lighter color to her feathers. They also have a more black coloring to their feathers. In the center of this clearing, there is this large mud wallow, and mud wallows like these are used by animals like elephants or rhinos. They'll use them as a means to help cool off, and it also acts as a form of natural sun protection. Though they have very thick skin, about three inches thick, they can still get sunburned just like you or me. And there is a crash of white rhinos out here, here to the right hand side. We're going to try to get a little bit closer to them in just a few minutes. And if we do get any closer to them, you're going to notice that their ears are perking up going back and forth. That will be because they are hearing us before they see us. They can really only see you clearly within about 10 feet of range, so again, watch out for those ears. We're going to be passing very close alongside another ostrich out here to the left. But if we keep our eyes peeled over on this hill, I did just see a cheetah walking about moments oh, ago. I'm going to try oh to gosh. see if we can spot them again, but their camouflage does work very, very well. Cheetahs are the fastest land animals on the entire planet, running at speeds of about 60 miles an hour. However, they can only maintain these speeds for a few hundred yards, after which they will need to rest about 30 minutes. We're going to see them all the way up at the top of this hill to the left. And if you look underneath their eyes, you're going to notice some black tear lines under there. Those black tear lines function in the same way as the black lines that football players put underneath their eyes. Helps to keep their glare out so they can see their prey just a little bit better, as they are one of the only big cats to do their hunting during the daytime. And it looks as though this ostrich over here is just going to let us follow right behind them. <laughs> trying to replace me as the safari guide out here today, or they're trying to get a ride on the truck. Unfortunately, if they would like to ride the safari, they do have to wait in the standby line. I'm not sure that they booked their fast pass. <laughs> Coming up ahead of us are some Kobe Rock formations. And Kobe Rocks act almost like a giant term in my mouth. And the fact that they allow many different animals to see the savanna from a much higher vantage point gives them just a little bit of a better view. It can also help to regulate their different body temperatures. Depending on the weather outside, it can help to heat them up or cool them off. So we'll see if we find a new one hanging about by these Kobe Rocks. I do believe I know of an area where we can find a nest of ostrich eggs. We're going to try to pull around there in just a moment. But if we look over to our right hand side, this is a very, very special animal. This is a Bontabok over here to the right. Now the Bontabok is so special to us because at one point in time, there was only 17 of them left on the entire planet. To put this in some perspective, there's actually about double the amount of people on this truck right now than there were Bontabok on the entire globe. 
They're being hunted for their coats as their coats do reflect a more purplish hue in just the right daylight. But thankfully, due to some conservation efforts, their numbers have slowly been able to rise back to the thousands. If we get a close look at one of their faces, you're going to notice some white markings on there that kind of resemble burning candles. That's where they get their name. Their name directly translates to candle goat. Looks like there are some pretty large burrows over here with some warthogs hanging about. We're going to see them all the way towards the base of that tree over there. And warthogs are the largest burrowing mammals on the entire planet. They have two sets of tusks. Their top two are used for burrowing, whereas their bottom two are used for self-defense. Now, oftentimes when we talk about the warthog, we do hear the word Pumba thrown around, but I wouldn't go calling anyone a Pumba as it is an insult in Swahili, meaning foolish one. <laughs> and warthogs do have a pretty interesting trot. They kind of walk about with their tails sticking up straight in the air. And Disney animators did help to study this for their movie The Lion King, both the 1994 version and the 2019 version. So you can see those movements reflected through the character Pumba. They're going to see this crash of white, of white rhinos over here on the right-hand side, alongside this nest of ostrich eggs. And ostrich eggs are very, very sturdy. They weigh about three pounds. They are so sturdy that if you were to try to stand on top of them, they would not break. You might have noticed that some of their ears are perking up on towards us over here. Now, ostriches do lay communal nests. That means that once one ostrich lays one egg, the rest will lay their eggs there as well. And they'll all help to take care of them. We are now exiting the savannah. We're heading out towards the Magadi Glen. Magadi Glen is the word for hot springs, and I can't get pretty bumpy out here, so make sure you're holding on to all valuables, including children. Now, much like in the little Atari forest, the animals out here can be very, very elusive, so we do have to keep our eyes peeled once more and see if we can spot anybody hanging around. It might be very, very hard to see over here at the end of this dirt path on the right. It does look as though there is a scimitar horned orcs laying down all the way towards the back. They're behind some of that brush all the way at the end of the dirt path. They kind of blend in with their surroundings as they have a caramel colored neck, but the scimitar horned orcs gets its name from the Middle Eastern sword of the same name, the scimitar. That's what its horns are shaped like. They are desert animals. They can go about nine months of the year without drinking any water at all. They get the majority of their hydration from the vegetation that they eat. And they're special to us much like the Bondabok because their numbers were dropping out there in the wild as well. In fact, when I was born, they were considered extinct out in the wild. There were zero of them left in any of those deserts out there in Africa. Through some conservation efforts, their numbers too have slowly been brought back, and in good news, in 2016, they were reintroduced back in the wild for the very first time. Now, if you have like the animals that you've seen out here on the safari, if you'd like to help protect them, there are many different things you can do. They could be as simple as turning off the water when you brush your teeth, or you can donate to organizations like the Disney Conservation Fund. This is a conservation fund that we are partnered with at all of our shops out here in Morocco. You get a beautiful little button for donating. And currently, those proceeds are going towards bringing the lion population back, as in the last 20 years, we have actually lost over 50% of the lion population worldwide. We now down to only about 20,000 lions. So by donating, we can help to not only double their population by 2050, we get them to about 50,000. Unfortunately, my friends, it does look as though we are approaching the outskirts of the village of Rome. So I do want to say, Asante, Sami, that means thank you.